Not really, got it's too long. All right. Congressional changes under President Jefferson. Now, let's think about this, see if we're thinking, see if we're smart. How well is Jefferson going to do with congressional changes? Will he be, be successful or not successful? Why, Kyle? Very good, because the new Congress is controlled by the Republican Party. Jefferson's going to convince him to make several changes in the federal government. He's lucky. He's got his party in charge of Congress. So I'm going to give you five changes that Jefferson proposed to Congress that they acted on during his presidency. So when we say congressional changes under President Jefferson, these are things Jefferson wanted changed in the federal government and was able to do so successfully because the Congress at this time was controlled by the Republican Party, the same party as the president. Okay? So, the first thing they did is they repealed what? Something that was really controversial. Whiskey. Whiskey. Very good. He repealed the excise tax on whiskey. See, if we weren't lecturing today, you wouldn't be blossoming like you're blossoming. Kyle first, Hannah second. I mean, you guys are all over. We can't waste education and knowledge. So the first thing Congress did is they repealed the excess tax on, ta on whiskey. Because because President Jefferson thought that was unconstitutional anyway. He didn't like it from the start. So he convinced Congress, number one, to repeal the excise tax on whiskey. Wait, what is that word? Do you spell it? Excise? Yeah, E-X-C-I-S-E. E-X-C-I-S-E. <coughs> okay. Now think a little bit. What else might Congress repeal that... Adams might have done that Jefferson didn't like. Uh, the judges. Yes, he repealed the Judiciary Act of 1801. They repealed the Judiciary Act of 1801. And what did the Judiciary Act of 1801 do? Added 16. 16 judges to the court. Those are the midnight judges that were appointed by President Adams. And when he repealed the Judiciary Act of 1801, it meant that these midnight judges that were appointed by President Adams could not assume office. Now, he did allow one. Which one did he allow? Marshall. John Marshall. Okay, he thought that was a good choice. But all these last-minute appointments that Adams made to the, to, to the judiciary by, as a result of the Judiciary Act of 1801, that law was repealed, and none of those judges legally could assume office, although he allowed John Marshall to do so. Okay? Now, this was kind of interesting. This wasn't a change, but it's worth noting. Congress actually kept the National Bank of the United States, even though Jefferson thought it was unconstitutional. Jefferson was very much against the Bank of the United States, but thought about it, and Congress kept it. So Congress will keep the National Bank of the United States, even though President Jefferson thought the bank to be unconstitutional. They'll keep it. Now, you know what they hadn't done yet that they were promised they promised they would do? They hadn't done it yet. They said they were going to do it, but they didn't do it. And so what happened is that Congress, number four, Congress allowed Jefferson to order Secretary of the Treasury Albert Gallatin to use federal money to pay off what? Those state debts that had not been done yet. Remember the big controversy that led to the Assumption Bill? Adams' administration really never got that thing rolling. And so one of the changes in Congress during the Jefferson presidency is Congress allowed President Jefferson to order his Secretary of the Treasury, Albert Gallatin, to use federal government money to start paying off those state debts that we promised we would pay off as a result of the Assumption Bill. Because Adams kind of sat on that. Okay? Gallatin. Remember, he was the one that the Gallatin River in Montana was named after? Albert Gallatin. Um, should be on your ID sheet, but I'll give it to you. G-A-L-L-A-T-I-N. Is it not on your... Maybe it isn't on your sheet. I bet it isn't. No, because I threw that in. So, Secretary of State... It's you're right. Yeah. Albert. Yeah. Best Fish and River in Montana. I'm trying to get Andrew Lamb on it. I don't know if he's been on it yet or not, but we've talked about it. So, Congress allowed President Jefferson to order Secretary of the Treasury Albert Gallatin 
to use federal money to pay off the state debts. Also, Congress, number five, a change they made is they cut funding to both the Army and Navy and reduced them in size. Cut funding to both the Army and Navy to reduce them in size. I'm not sure what the philosophy was behind that, but it was done. And we'll see if it comes back to haunt us. So, those are the five congressional changes under President Jefferson, although one really wasn't a change, it was a stand pat. One, Congress repealed the excise tax on whiskey. Two, Congress repealed the Judiciary Act of 1801. Three, Congress kept the National Bank of the United States. Four, Congress allowed Jefferson to order his Secretary of the Treasury, Albert Gallatin, to use federal money to pay off those state debts. And five, Congress cut funding to both the Army and Navy and reduced them in size. Okay? That'll take us to our next subtopic, which is the election of 1804. The election of 1804. Well, who's going to run for the Republicans, do you think? Jefferson. President Jefferson is going to run again. And the Federalist candidate will be somebody we already talked about, Charles Hickney. So, President Jefferson will run for re-election on the Republican Party ticket, and Charles Pinckney will run on the Federalist ticket. In who, what was Charles Pinckney in history? What was he? Yeah, he ran for vice president with who? With that. Yep. Well, who ran with Jefferson in the last election? Anybody remember? Aaron Burr. And he decided to run for the governorship of New York, so Jefferson had to change his vice presidential candidates, and he went with a guy by the name of George Clinton. So Aaron Burr will not run with Jefferson because Aaron Burr has made the decision to run for governor of New York. And as a result of that, Jefferson then picks George Clinton to run with him. Now remember, the new rule states what? They have, to, they have to vote on the same ticket for president and vice president. There'll be no more of this, whoever gets the first number of votes is president, etc. So you're voting for a party. Well, Jefferson and Clinton won a sweeping victory, and they carried 11 of the 13 states. They carried 11 of the 13 states. Only Delaware and Connecticut went to Clinton. So Jefferson... President Jefferson and George Clinton, I said that, George Clinton won the sweeping victory. They carried 11 of 13 states. The only state that went, states that went to Charles Pinckney were Delaware and Connecticut. So it was a butt kick. 11 states to two, but the only states voting for uh, Charles Pinckney were Delaware and Connecticut. Matter of fact, this was the, other than the no running against George Washington, basically, this was the largest margin of victory in American history to that point, okay? Uh, Washington didn't run against anybody, so you really couldn't count that, okay? So this is the largest victory, margin of victory in American history to that point. Okay, let's go to Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Interesting story. That's it, yeah. Do you want to have one? Do you guys remember the time that old Mason came up with the response that I considered not very smart? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, this is going to come back. How to, could we? This is going. This is going to come. This is going to come back to haunt you in just a few minutes. Okay. All right. As I mentioned, Aaron Burr decided to campaign for governor of New York rather than the vice presidency prior to the election of 1804. Right. That's what we told you. Well, Alexander Hamilton did not like. Aaron Burr, and he didn't trust him. And he was a Federalist, right? Okay, he didn't like Burr, didn't trust him. So what did he do is he urged people to vote against Burr in this election for governor, okay? So he went out on his own and just said, don't vote for Aaron Burr for governor of New York. He really went out of his way, didn't like him, didn't trust him, and he went out of his way to try to get people not to vote for him, okay? And Burr eventually lost the election, and who did he blame? Yeah, he blamed Hamilton. So when Aaron Burr decided not to run for the vice presidency and try to secure the governorship of New York, Alexander Hamilton, who disliked Burr and distrusted him, decided to campaign vigorously against him. And in the end, Burr ends up 
losing this election, and he's very upset, and he blames Hamilton. And so he demands an apology for Hamilton because of the uncomplimentary remarks that were made about him during this campaign for governor in this election. So Burr steps up publicly and demands an apology from Alexander Hamilton because of uncomplimentary remarks that Hamilton made about Burr during this process of this election for the governorship of New York. Well, Hamilton tells him to forget it, and so Burr challenges Hamilton to a duel. And I'm challenging you to a duel. And we're going to have it Wednesday. Right out there. You and me. Huh? No, it's going to be about high one o'clock. Well, when Hamilton refused to apologize, Burr challenged him to a duel. And Hamilton accepted the challenge. So the two men met early in the morning of July 11th, 1804. July 11th, 1804, these two men meet. Yes, my dear? Was Alexander Hamilton also running? Or he just no, he just got after it. He's okay. So on, Jan on July 11th, 1804, Hamilton and Burr meet for their duel. Now, I don't know if you know anything about duels, but I'm going to explain it to you real quick. Like, and he's going to find out about it. Because he and I are getting after it Wednesday. Just want you to know. So the two people stand back to back. And they have their pistols, which we will have high pants full of uh, uh, whipping cream. This is actually happening. Oh my God. No, this is happening Wednesday. Yeah, I've challenged him for a duel for, for making inappropriate remarks. And I've been waiting for this. That's why I was so strong in my response. So anyway, here's how it works. So they're back to back, and you have an agreed upon number of paces. Once they get to the paces, you turn and shoot. Now, here's how the rule works. If, if we get in this, if you get in a duel and I turn and shoot at Buck, and I miss Buck, or even if I hit him in the leg, I have to stand where I'm at and allow Buck to fire back. That's how it works. <laughs> no, it's, that's how they work. And if you don't, or run, or, or whatever, then whoever's monitoring the duel, which in this case will be Kyle, just so you know. <laughs> Whoever's monitoring the duel would actually shoot the other person dead. Do I get one? For not following. Yeah, you'll have one. <laughs> for not following the rule. Now, seriously. So, keep that in mind. It's it's not, it, both people get an equal chance. Now, if I turn first and shoot Buck and kill him, I don't have to worry about him returning fire, right? Yes. Alright, two questions. One, could, if they kept their feet planted, could they duck or something? I think, well, I think they could, actually the gentlemanly thing to do would be to stand and take your shot. You couldn't run or duck. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't step over here, though. The same trips. What if then they both turn and shoot right at the same time that they both make? Okay, good question. If they both turn at the same time and miss, the duel is over. Or, which has happened in history, if they both get together and decide this wasn't very smart, they may agree both to fire in the air. There's lots of things you can do. But the rule is, once you turn and stand, you both get a shot. Now, if you've got to get strategy, do you want to try to shoot first and hopefully get the you know, jump on the person? Or do you want to, knowing they're a bad shot, give them a shot at missing you and then you get to take care of the there's a lot of strategy to it, yeah. <laughs> no, they'll have to, no, that's a good question. The monitor, in this case, Kyle, will say one, two, three, four, and then when you get to the number of paces, which will be five with you and I, because you can't shoot a tight pie tin full of shaving cream or whatever near as far from ten paces. So we're going to go five. Okay, so you get a number of paces and it's counted off, and then you turn and shoot. Now again, this is a big honorable deal that you cannot vary. As Mason said, I, I'm sure you might be able to move, but you've got you can't run or move anywhere off your pace. You have to stand. Now we're going to talk about a duel with Andrew Jackson that was quite amazing later. Duels were the way people, gentlemen settled arguments. Well, anyway, let's just finish the story. So both so both Hamilton and Burr were placed back to back and were given a number of paces to take before turning towards each other and firing their pistols, okay? Well, 
When they took their paces, Burr raised his pistol, took aim, and fired. Hamilton made no effort to fire at Burr. Unfortunately for Hamilton, he was wounded and fell mortally to the ground. What does that mean? No? He died later. Mortally means you're mortally wounded, means you will not recover from your wounds. So they, they take off the number of paces at the signal to fire. Bird turned, raised his pistol, and shot first. For whatever reasons only known to Alexander Hamilton, he did not refer, return fire. Maybe he couldn't. Maybe he was wounded too bad. Who knows? But in the fact was, Hamilton made no attempt to fire at Burr, and he fell mortally wounded and died shortly afterwards. So it's a fair fight. Not quite the Western draw deal, but everything is considered, and it was considered fair. Well, Aaron Burr, in, late in 1806, was involved in some real vague scheme against the government. Nothing big. It might be like somebody saying that they didn't think Obama was a very good president. The vague scheme that Senator Barrasso was involved in last Friday as he criticized the president. I mean, it's a really, really light thing, okay? Well, even though it was what considered a vague scheme, he was arrested and charged with treason because who was mad at him? Federalists. Yeah. So even though, you know, in a couple years later is my point, even though he did this right, People didn't like the fact he killed Alexander Hamilton, especially Federalists, right? So they trumped up some charges against him in 1806, and he was arrested and charged with treason. Yes? So because Hamilton agreed to the duel, it wasn't considered manslaughter or anything? No, no, it was, I mean, when you challenge somebody, if, you didn't, if I challenged you to a duel and you said no, what would you be looked upon in society as? Coward. Yeah. Coward. So there was really no... Now, if I got mad at you in spite, and you and I are mad at each other, we really do like each other, but I was stupid enough to challenge you to a duel, and you were stupid enough to say, yeah, okay, because you don't want to be considered a coward, you don't have the duel like five minutes later. There's a date and time set. You and I probably get this. We're going to want these ten paces. We're both going to fire in the air. That way nobody loses any pace. You say, okay. That what happens if one got fired in the air, and then the other guy like, Well, you would, you, you, you could do that, but somebody might figure out that, and that's happened, and, and that's happened in duels before where somebody was sprayed and fired in the air, hoping that the other person would say, oh, yeah, but sometimes they said, yeah, he's right, and sometimes they said, no, that bastard. <laughs> so, I mean, there's all, kinds of, there's all kinds of ways to do it, but in this case, this case, Hamilton was killed. Well, who was the Supreme Court Justice at this time? John Marshall. And he was a sensible man, and he knew this wasn't right, that these were trumped up charges. And so what he did is when it came to the Supreme Court, he acquitted Burr, but suggested that he might want to do what? Apologize. Maybe better than lay low. Apologize. Move to where? Close, Europe. So what happened is when Supreme Court Justice John Marshall, Marshall acquitted Burr, he then moved to Europe to kind of lay low. Acquitted, A-Q, A-C-Q, excuse me, A-C-Q, U, I, T, T, E, D. A-C-Q, U, I, T, T, E, D. So Burr moves to Europe. Now, does he stay there the rest of his life? No, actually, when it cools down a little, he comes back to New York, but he eventually died under the shadow of disapproval. He never really was ever really accepted again. So. Although this was correct in the way they did it, Burr was treated poorly, arrested and accused of treason, put it, you know, because of his actions against the government. Supreme Court Justice John Marshall could see this wasn't right, so he acquitted him, but once he's acquitted, he just thought he better be moved to Europe and got laid low. And then he came back to New York and basically died under a cloud of disapproval. He never was ever accepted again. It's kind of a sad story, but true. Okay, that'll take us then to our next subtopic, which is the war in Europe. We're going to have a war in Europe. What, who's going to be in this war? Britain and France. Well, especially France. Remember, Napoleon sold us Louisiana because he's trying to conquer Europe. So, here we go. Okay, so the war in Europe. So, as we are doing our thing back in America, 
Napoleon begins his conquest of Europe. That was his goal. That's why he sold us the Louisiana Territory in the first place. Okay? And it does involve, as somebody said on this side, Great Britain and France. And now even though we're not in the war, this is going to saw, uh, this is going to create some serious problems for the United States. Okay? So, the war in Europe, which involved Great Britain and France, created serious problems for the United States. Now, Napoleon was pretty successful because by 1807, he had conquered most of Europe with the exception of two places, Russia and Great Britain. Those were the only two areas that he really had not conquered by 1807. So he was on a roll. He was on a mission. But by 1807, he still had not secured Russia or Great Britain. And the reason he was having so much trouble with Great Britain is the French actually had a stronger army, but what did Great Britain have? Much stronger navy, okay? Now, if you're the United States, you're thinking to yourself, man, this might provide a good opportunity for us, because what do both Great Britain and France need? Supplies and trade. So the United States planned to make really good profits on trading with the two countries. That was the plan. You could make some good money during war by supplying the two warring countries with supplies they need. Okay? So the United States has it in their mind, man, we're going to make some profit here. Well, who controls the seas in this war? Britain. And they're going to make sure that we do not send any supplies to France. So Great Britain, who controls the seas, made sure that France did not receive any American supplies. So what did the British start duty, doing? We talked about it before. What? Seizing American ships and impressing 